Everybody and welcome to Rewind to Dynamite. It's John Pollock here alongside Waiting. And tonight we are on dry land as we cover tonight's taped edition of AEW Dynamite. Way, how are you? Are you seasick from the last two hours? Not seasick. I am a little jet lagged though, admittedly. It is still uh, catching up to me right now. So apologies in advance. Oh dear. Okay. Well, we are, we are going to keep you energized. I promise. Oh, I'm always good. Once the record button's up, I mean, you know what? Uh, I'm not affected at all. You're the Terry Funk of podcasting. Once that red light goes on, all of the all of the wear and tear goes away. Imagine him in like a fiend match. In a fiend match? Yeah, with the red light. Oh, I I think Terry Funk could actually pull that off fairly fairly well. In in. In his earlier years, perhaps. Energized maybe. by red light, he'd be like, he'd be 20 again. Could be, yeah. I mean, for the longest time, that was always what I would hear about Kurt Angle as well, that he would be just barely getting around backstage at those impact shows, but then goes out, guy would put on a four-star match on every pay-per-view. So maybe, I, I don't think Kurt Angle would be able to pull that off after we saw the, the final performances of Kurt Angle last year. We'll never know. Um, way before we start things off, the, the Royal Rumble pool, it's open. People can go join postwrestling.com slash rumble. It's free to enter. And when do they have to get all their picks in before the rumble Sunday at 3 PM Eastern. So, uh, you definitely still have a bit of time, uh, and a lot of entries pouring in already. So, uh, the results will be read next week on this very show, Rwanda Dynamite. Yes, yes. Our our man uh, Chris Engler, he's he's on his own uh uh rager at sea. On an island, but yeah. You know, on a destination yeah. out there. So yes, we will have the winners announced on this show next week. So three PM Eastern time, get your picks in by Sunday. Uh it's a very detailed pool, so no screwing around. Get get you're gonna have to dedicate some time to really plan this out. You don't wanna be just a just an also ran. In this pool, you better be in it to win it. We only want winners that are joining this pool. There's no, there's no fun about this. This is a serious, serious competition, and only the the elite of people selecting Royal Rumble picks should be entering this. Will you be entering? No, no, I will not be. Oh, so you, so you're not one of these winners, or elite? I think it'd be a, it'd be a conflict of interest. Like, what if I won? Well, what would I win? What, what, what's at stake here? Uh. I think it's 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 maybe just for fun and for bragging rights, and I think we would automatically disqualify you and move on to the next winner. Well, see, I would put all this effort into making my picks, and then at the end, I'd be disqualified. So, well, all that said, I believe you and I will be participating in some form of draft uh, because we'll be a part of uh, up next uh, Patreons, whatever like they've got. Davy's got something cooked up on the. Up yeah, next I have Patreon. no idea what I I am doing. Uh, on this show like, like he's asked us to like you know uh join him tomorrow we'll be recording it and they'll be uploading it but it's like i'm i i it's it's a little shrouded in mystery exactly what this rumble draft is but i'm i'm looking forward to it don't we have to come up with uh some questions 15 questions i came up with them oh jesus you've done that already well that will be uh that's my homework i guess okay well look forward to that on the uh, the up next uh patreon feed uh over the coming days, and Braden and Davey will also have a show up on Saturday night after Worlds Collide, and then myself and Way are going to be live after the Royal Rumble. Uh, you can tune in live if you're a Double Double Ice Cap or Espresso member, and bonus for those tuning into the Royal Rumble post show, I have just carved out our table into the shape of a triangle because Mike Murray is going to be joining us on Sunday. Arch. Back by popular demand. Triangular table, lovely. Yeah, I got a lot of compliments about Mike Murray uh, since he joined us for the TLC show. I so, believe Mike is a part of this uh, uh, up next draft as well, so a lot of Mike Murray this week. 
a lot of Mike Murray. So uh, you can look forward to that on Sunday, as well as all of our uh, regular shows, including a special live show Friday night. Way and I will be coming at you uh, in lieu of the Cafe Hangout, which is off this week. It will be back next week. Uh, we're going to go live Friday night for all patrons. Way is going to give us a review of SmackDown, and I'm going to be reviewing NWA Hard Times. And we're going to see who had the harder time on Friday night. We'll compare notes. I, I like these kind of dual reviews way where we're uh, informing the other of what they missed. Yeah, yeah, I, I like them too. And um, they 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 are always great studies of contrast, I believe. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll get into that NWA card a little later on, but let's let's go into some news items. Uh, Raw had a very big bounce back this week. Uh, last last week they got slaughtered by the uh, college football uh, the championship game. So this week uh, they were back up two million three hundred and eighty thousand viewers. And what was interesting was looking at across the board uh, how big they were up in so many different demos. Uh, in the 18 to 49 demo, they were up 36 percent. Uh, this was also a show that really hit big with females. Uh, 12 to 34 was up 48 percent from last week. Uh, 18 to 49 was up 47 and a half percent. Just huge gains from last week. And even if you go back two weeks ago, when you factor out football, uh, still up. So uh, overall, this was a this was a pretty big sign for Raw this week. I, I would take as a positive they beat out the. Celtics uh, Lakers game that was going on against them as well. So not sure what it is that necessarily hit with a lot of people. And this wasn't in in total viewers like this monstrous number, but certainly uh, a big bounce back from last week. You know, I wonder how much of it has to do with perhaps um, the, the, the launch into the world rumble. And I think what, you know, WWE fans really determined to be the start of the playoff season. I would anticipate a bit more interest coming out of, especially the rumble this the Sunday and then onwards to WrestleMania. Yeah. So a, a positive sign and they should, you would think have a pretty good number next week coming off of the Royal rumble, which is traditionally a very big number for raw coming off uh, that big of a pay-per-view. So um, UFC numbers as well. They did tremendous numbers for their prelims on Saturday. They did 1,767,000 viewers. It's their highest number uh, since moving to ESPN for the prelims. So that was certainly the trickle down effect of Conor McGregor, but this was a, an enormous night for them uh, on ESPN and on ESPN plus for the pay-per-view itself. Edge did an interview. This was on uh, this Pearl jam podcast, which here's a, a great bit of advice for people out there. When you want to get, uh, guys, whether it's it's fighters, wrestlers, anyone, you want them to really open up about stuff, get them on a show that has nothing to do with their chosen profession and things that they actually uh, have a real passion for. Uh, not that Edge doesn't have a passion for wrestling, but getting them outside of that, that's where you get these guys to open up. And he was asked about you know, the potential of a return, which I think a lot of people are looking at potentially for something this weekend. And his quote was, All of these rumors happening that I've been to Pittsburgh and I've been cleared to wrestle again and I've signed a new contract and I I have no idea where any of it came from. The last time I was in Pittsburgh, I had my wrist fused in 2013. I don't know. I don't know. But I would go to Pittsburgh to see Pearl Jam for sure, but I haven't been there and I haven't signed a contract. I think I would know, but I get this. And again, I'll use Tsunami, this tsunami of comments saying you're coming back. You signed a contract. I'm like, I really haven't. Oh, yeah. That's what you'd say. I'm just like, all right, whatever. So it seems like Edge is vehemently dismissing um, any of this. Uh, I, I, I won't even say it's speculation. Like There, there have been, I think, uh, very credible reports about Edge uh, over the past year. Uh, we've seen Dave Meltzer and Mike Johnson report on this about uh, signing a new deal. Uh, Mike Johnson had reported months ago that he was in Pittsburgh on WWE business, whatever that means, but that is where... You know, if Edge had to get cleared, it would be from Dr. Joseph Maroon. That would be the natural assumption who is based in Pittsburgh. And it's a lot of connecting the dots here. But when you throw in all the different little pieces way from the spear to Elias at SummerSlam, randomly being mentioned in that uh, segment with Randy Orton a couple of weeks ago. uh, I mean, are you 
are you looking at this as a uh, as a, a possible scenario? Because if he, if, he, if this is all designed around a WrestleMania return for Edge, then Sunday is the day for Edge to return. Or do you feel that this is just uh, what? What are your thoughts? Well, when it came time to making my picks for the pool and you know the surprise portion, really, I feel like the first name that that's coming to a lot of people's minds is is Edge. Uh, I I'm basing this more so on I think my trust in the uh, credibility credibility of the people that have reported this news than anything. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, if it was just a rumor that was being spread by, I think maybe less credible journalists. I don't think I would think too much of it, but because Dave and Mike Johnson are two of the best uh, that do this, and because they, uh, at least Mike Johnson, from what I hear, is still sticking by it, uh, I definitely lead lend a lot more, um, you know, credibility to to the rumors. And what are, what is a guy like Edge supposed to say when asked about? Well, that that's it. Right? I mean, he's out there. He's on a non wrestling podcast. First of all, I don't think he'd be putting himself. You, you have to remember, he also has discontinued his podcast with Christian where, it, you know, it was it was interesting. I dug up this this quote from his podcast when he was still doing it. And this was after the spear to Elias. And I, I won't go through the whole thing, but he pretty much was just saying, like, if he could he do another match? He said, yes, it all comes down to being cleared, but could he do a year of matches? Probably not, but he can definitely do one more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just, everything is certainly aligning for this, that I I think this is certainly something to to very much be giving credence to as a possibility for Sunday. Possible. Yeah. Now, would you do it on Sunday though? Would you do it at the rumble? If obviously he's not going to win it. I think if you're going to – if he's doing WrestleMania, I would shoot the angle at the Rumble. I, I think that's – In the match itself. Um, it it doesn't have to be in the match. I mean, it could be something else. Um, it doesn't have to be in the match, but I, I think that that I, – I, I don't really like the idea of him winning, but it wouldn't that, – that wouldn't be shocking either if winning he's coming Rumble, back. Winning the Rumble, really? Uh, I, I, I'm, it would not be my choice, but he would be – the big story coming out of the rumble. So how do you handle that? Do you eliminate him or do you have him come up? Like, this is the big show to me. This is, this is where you do it. I wouldn't be waiting till the February pay-per-view or doing it on raw. I think this is the time to do it. If he is doing WrestleMania, definitely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We shall see. I mean, I don't know if it, I feel like you could, um, I think it would be big no matter what, you know, if he appeared on the Raw after the Rumble, I think it would be pretty big, just as just as big. Um, and even if he got eliminated, I don't think that would really hurt the anticipation at all. There are ways to do it to set up his opponent that you know people wouldn't really mind. So. You, you want to come out of it with a, a direction of where he's going for WrestleMania and and having something set up. But it would be uh, it would probably be the biggest reaction of the show. I think people, even with all of this discussion going into it, there would still be the people that are absolutely shocked at it but it's it just seems everything aligns for this certainly or he could have just been there for a pearl jam show maybe he's just going to say uh maybe he's going to show up and uh be accompanied by jeremy borash and they're going to come out to jeremy i knew you were searching in your role i was was trying pearl jam is not exactly uh the the top of my uh, <laughs> uh were you a pearl jam fan you no, don't strike not, me as a pearl not jam so much fan. not so much yeah but uh, uh they yeah. kind of missed you and i what about larry walker going into the baseball hall of fame does that mean anything to you not at all and and uh what an really? interesting pivot oh what, i thought larry how you, walker how did you get the larry walker from pearl jam and edge well edge canadian Larry Walker, second Canadian to go into the Baseball Hall of Fame. I would think that was during your peak of baseball viewing. It's like Larry I mean, I Walker was a, I was playing for the Expos. Oh, yeah. I was a huge Jays fan. Not so not so much the Expos, unfortunately. Oh, I love the Expos. The Expos, especially when I got Tony La Russa baseball, the Expos were my favorite team to play. They really? Honestly, they, I thought their 94 team oh, yeah. was, was more impressive than the Blue Jays, I will say more impressive than the Jays of 92. I wouldn't say the Jays of 93. The Jays of 93 was just a uh, a stacked, stacked team. But team to team, I'd go Expos 94 over Jays of 92. I wouldn't dis- disagree with that. But, you know, again, we'll never know. Uh, I think the I think the Expos unofficially won the World Series in 94. So I like to think that three Canadians uh, World Series victories occurred from 92 to 94. They should have given them like half the trophy. They should have given them something. I mean, what a, what a lineup they had. 
the days of like Marquise Grissom, the Delino De Shields, John Wetland as a closer. I, I knew like that entire team. They were uh they were a great team. But I had no anyway, idea you had this uh this this, th- this was my ins- th- this was when I was obsessed with baseball. Uh, the other person to go into the Hall of Fame. I'll get right back to wrestling right after this, but I can feel your excitement. I I am the cure to jet lag, by the way. Oh, for am sure. Am I not? Yeah, you talking to baseball? Yeah, sign me right up. So Larry Walker gets in, and he gets in. You know, the Observer, the cutoff is sixty percent. The Baseball Hall of Fame, seventy five percent. It's a high, okay. high threshold. Wow, and that's he, really high. Yeah, Larry Walker just got in. It was like seventy six point something percent he got in by. So it was very thin. Derek Jeter, he was the other one to get elected. 99.7%. One person didn't vote for him. (laughs) And now everyone, because you don't have to disclose your ballot. So now everyone is trying to find out who is the person that didn't vote for Derek (laughs) Jeter. And I cannot, the, 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 uh, my immediate thought is when Okada is on the ballot next year, like to me, that is the one hundred percent threshold for Okada. Who who cannot vote for Okada to go into the Hall of Fame? So I'm expecting next year someone won't, and I think everyone is going to have to reveal their ballot if they don't. Um, I had no idea there was so much uh, drama in baseball Hall of Fame selection. Oh, there's a lot of criticism of the the Hall of Fame. The fact that We've next year, n- next year, it's it's not as a uh, stacked of a ballot, and you have Roger Clemens. You have Barry Bonds, and uh, there's someone else outstanding in the in that list as well. But the the ones that are like really tied to the PED era that had they not been associated with that, that they would they would be in. And it's a big debate of like whether they should be in or not. And the younger voters that are coming up, if they're going to be more lenient towards those that were linked to PEDs during their career versus the older guard, that pretty much has been a hard no towards. Uh, electing those those candidates fascinating would that would that deter you uh as a baseball fan of someone that openly you know was mm-hmm. connected to performance enhancing drugs would that stop you from voting for somebody even though Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens like the numbers are indisputable but you have to look at um you're looking at it from a different point of view as well I guess I'm not as really well read on on exactly, I think, um, how those controversies arose. I mean, how much do we know about the era before that and PED usage? Uh, You know, was there a a generation of guys who just basically didn't get caught because it was just not simply not a topic? It's pretty much if you were not if you if you were not caught, then you're not implicated in all of this. Um, Yeah, it's it. I, I could certainly see why a lot of people are just adamant against voting them in. Um, I don't know. I, I think I would really have to think that one over because I, I'm not an immediate no at all, especially when we're talking the caliber of, of players. I think of especially Barry bonds and Roger Clements, I think especially coming from like combat sports too, where I, I could guarantee you like whether in wrestling or MMA, that's not really that big of a, of an issue. Well, let's and forget about the era of MMA of, you know, of 10, 15 years ago where you didn't have USADA testing to this degree, look at this current era and a PED failure is not disqualifying to anyone's legacy. Like, is there anyone that if you had a, if you had a ballot for an MMA Hall of Fame, I'm still voting Anderson Silva in. And yeah. I, I don't think the MMA industry is as, like it's still like a mark of shame, but it does not, to me, disqualify you from inclusion in a legitimate Hall of Fame. Although some might for an Anderson Silva, some might for you know what John Jones has gone through. But I, I don't think either of those two. It would certainly not be the majority that would not be voting those two into a MMA Hall of Fame. I think even beyond that, I mean, you know, when when talking about maybe some of the, let's say, okay, let's say, uh, like. Do you think Floyd Mayweather is going to be not be in a boxing hall of fame? You know, like we're, we're talking maybe issues that might be questionable about these characters, even outside of uh PD usage. I don't think we'll have that, that much impact on their legacies. Certainly. And, and then it becomes the debate too, of like, are you, are you voting for these people as exemplary citizens or just strictly for their, their talents? And that is where I, I do draw that line as well. If I was voting for the boxing hall of fame, 
Um, for a Floyd Mayweather Jr., I'm not taking that stuff into account. I would not be taking that stuff into account for Conor McGregor, even though I I have a lot of problems with you know the the actions of Conor McGregor. But I think when it comes to a Hall of Fame, everyone's going to have their different definition as well of wh- how far you extend that to include like their character and reputation. Uh, have they brought? a negative reputation to the sport. Have they harmed the sport in any way from their actions outside of a ring? Right. In other news, that was, that was the greatest from Larry Walker to that, uh, of where we went there. Um, let's just quickly blitz through these, uh, next ones. Impact has confirmed their next pay-per-view. It will be April 19th. It's going to be at terminal five in New York city. This will be the rebellion pay-per-view. We had known it would be April, but they had not given a specific date on the last pay-per-view. So that's when it will be, uh, two weeks after WrestleMania. Justin Barrasso had a report on SI.com today stating that, according to multiple sources, he confirmed with that AEW is in talks with Lance Archer to bring him to AEW. And he is not under contract to New Japan, which to me is still stunning that New Japan um, has some of these guys that it's just stunning that they are not under contract because Lance Archer is someone to me that I would be aggressively going after if i was uh, any major promotion in north america you know I, I heard about this even throughout the g1 after the g1 that that he might not have been under contract but you know the moment he won the u.s title i would assume that all that would have been fixed and that he was really primed for a bigger role the fact that he got onto wrestle kingdom in a pretty high profile match against john moxley to me seemed to bode well for like you know his his future being settled in new japan pro wrestling but then to hear a report like this and if if it's true i think is a uh, i would i think it would make new japan look really bad especially if they they had uh you know um any any sort of uh um uh, ambition to to break through the u.s where i think somebody like lance archer would would be the most valuable um he's been a breakout performer throughout the last year he he's definitely on my short list of, of most improved and would be a big loss, in my opinion, to New Japan Pro Wrestling and a big gain for AEW. Yeah, and you have to wonder with Lance Archer, to me, at his age, I would definitely be looking at not just the the money on paper, but also the term of what I'm being offered. Like if AEW comes at you with a three or four year deal, um, that that's very enticing to me at this age, knowing that I might not be wrestling for four years. And, you know, he he has worked his ass off to get one one final great contract and probably is going to sign the most lucrative contract of his career by far. Um, if he can get several, several people that are bidding for his services. So, I mean, good for this guy. He, he worked his ass off last year to get to a place where, you know, a company like AEW would be after him. New Japan, I'm sure wants to keep him. And, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there were others that, we're trying to get into the Lance Archer sweepstakes. I don't think his age is necessarily going to be a, de- uh, a deterrent for many companies. No, I don't think so either. No, not when he's performing like that. And the last thing here, uh, because we, we won't have the hangout on Thursday, just a quick look at the NWA pay-per-view that is happening on Friday night at 7 Eastern. They had their uh, season finale super show on Tuesday. It was a 90-minute edition of Power. And these are the matches we have set up for the pay-per-view. In the main event, it is Nick Aldis and Flip Gordon. This is an NWA versus ROH interpromotional match, so it doesn't appear the title is on the line. Aaron Stevens versus Scott Steiner for the NWA national title. Allison Kay versus Thunder Rosa for the women's title. The Rock and Roll Express against the Wild Cards against James Storm and Eli Drake for the tag titles. And then we have the TV title tournament with uh, a one night eight man tournament. Trevor Murdoch versus the question mark. Zicky Dice versus Dan Moff. Ken Anderson versus Tim Storm and Ricky Starks versus Matt Cross in the opening round matches, followed by the semifinals and finals. I will say after, did you see Power this week? No, I did not. That's one of the shows I really have to catch back up on, and I've kind of lapsed on with my trip, so uh, I did not. I, I, I feel like this pay-per-view, and I'd be curious what was going on behind the scenes that necessitated this pay-per-view, because it really felt they were going in the direction of Nick Aldis and Marty Skrull, and 
all of that kind of got detoured. Now we've got Flip Gordon out of nowhere in this spot that feels very cold, especially in a non-title scenario. And watching the pay- the show on Tuesday, like the programs they're building to are Nick Aldis and Marty Skrull. Uh, this showdown with Allison K and Melina, where Allison K first has to go through Thunder Rosa on this pay per view. Mr. Anderson, Ken Anderson, turning on Colt Cabana was the big angle on the show. And then setting up Aaron Stevens and Ricky Starks, all programs that were not getting at this pay per view on Friday. So th- this does feel like if you are not a big NWA fan, like hardly a must see pay per view, which I feel any company running pay per views these days, it has to be a really important one. And this kind of just feels like a bridge to the next one uh, a- after the fact, because Aldis and Skrull, like that's the big match they seem to be promoting. And they are advertising that Skrull will be there on Friday, just is not advertised for a match. So I'm curious to see how this show turns out. But if you just watch the TV on Tuesday, um, like it's really, it's like the TV title tournament is almost like the biggest focus of this show. And then everything else is just kind of a, uh, a bridge to the next chapter. Yeah, it does seem to me, you know, as as a fan who at this point maybe more so just ca- like relies on these pay per views to kind of know, you know, to to find jumping on points with NWA. I felt like the last one mm, had a bit more of a hook than this. This really just feels a bit more of a I would say B level pay per view, um, and maybe that's what you're going to get with them if they're if they're going to do this this many pay-per-views at this rate you know what a month two months in between it was yeah it was like the mid-december that they did their last one so we're talking like five six week turnaround yeah so maybe you know if if the plan is every six weeks to do one of these you might just end up with cards that are a little less than i think uh yeah i don't know uh must see uh like this but um we shall see. I mean, I do really feel like the maybe some of the idea behind doing so many shows is just so that this company can simply at least make a little bit of money because they're not making. I can't imagine they're they're making that much off off of YouTube revenue right now. So um, this just might be a way to at least collect a bit of a paycheck, even if you can't deliver the most stellar card every six weeks. All right. Well, that will take us now over to AEW Dynamite. This is the show from uh, Nassau in the Bahamas on the Jericho cruise. And first of all, what what did you just think overall of the feel of this show and, you know, differences just from the live arena setting? Did it work for you? It was outstanding, I thought. Uh, To me, that was the biggest hook of of watching this episode of Dynamite was to see how a wrestling show on a boat was going to look, feel uh, and sound. And I thought all it, it came across great. It reminded me a lot of like a Panama City outdoor nitro had yep. that feel with just like a, a real party atmosphere. Uh, except with a lot more wind this time because they're in the middle of the ocean. It was it was very windy. I yeah. mean, it was like some of the hair and yeah. Justin Roberts' pants. I thought were gonna like fly <laughs> off of them at certain points. But I loved just the idea of doing this, and I really like that AEW are looking for hooks like this, like just doing something visually appealing that looks totally different or a couple of weeks ago doing that Memphis tribute, like just little ideas that are hooks Mm -hmm. for the episode itself instead of just like avoiding just doing paint by numbers shows. So I really like that they were ambitious enough to try this this year. They're going to do it again next year and it looks like to be even more ambitious by doing it live. Um, So I really like that idea. My biggest uh, negative was a specific one for us in Canada. And it wasn't even just the hiccup at the beginning of the show where we got no sound for two minutes, but they have this thing where they... I I didn't have that issue. You had sound at the beginning? Yeah. I watched watched on the uh, TSN Go feed. Because on the channel, and and I looked on Twitter, and other people were having this problem, and it seemed to be a TSN problem. We had no audio for two minutes to start the show. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, but then, so, and this has been a consistent problem, but I thought it was just overdrive on this show was trying to censor the crowd and it's like, it really ruins the flow. I, I, I found this to be just so annoying. Do you know if this is, uh, an issue as well on TNT or was it TSN? I'm pretty sure this is a TSN issue because I think people would just be up in arms if the, if everyone was having this problem. I'm fairly certain it's what a TSN is, What was the issue. chance that they were trying to censor? 
fuck this boat was one and oh. i understand i understand that one but it was also like at one point chris jericho was on commentary and called moxley a son of a bitch they censored bitch and it was you know there were other chants i couldn't even make them out because they were censoring them but it was like consistent like just constantly cutting the audio out and it's what can I don't you know, do I, about that though I mean, if you're TSN, certainly it's like it's either the the quality of your wrestling show and people complaining about it online versus potentially getting into trouble with the CRTC. I mean, it just seems like there's an inconsistency because you can have like the occasional time when when we do hear a promo where they don't censor somebody, and I I just I can't imagine a crowd chanting like. I understand fuck. Fuck is probably uh, going too far, but most chants and like censoring bitch, I don't know. I just, I don't feel like that would be something that anyone would be complaining about to the CRTC over. I and I guess surprised, it's surprised, dude. A lot of people have some, a lot of free time on their hands. Well, for shit like this. I don't know. Like, I don't think this is an issue on, on TNT. So maybe it's just a different in, in standards, obviously. And I think TSN is just. Don't we being... know people who work at TSN? Didn't you ask them about something like this? I could, I could definitely check on this because I've, it, it's been something that they've been doing on these shows, but tonight it just felt like it was t- to the detriment of my enjoyment at times, which it hasn't been in the past. It's just something I just learned to accept, but it just sure. felt so much more tonight. Yeah. Um, but you know, like, I, I Sorry, please. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say just more, more so on like the the feel and the atmosphere of this show. To me, I, I think be, beyond how it looked, I thought they captured it really well. I mean, I almost feel like a daytime taping might have even been better because you would have had a bit more of a a sense of like the actual boat itself and maybe just the fact that they were on water in the dark. It really at times, I mean, it felt cool, felt outdoor, but um. I, I, how would that be see. different though? Shooting that with the sun wouldn't wouldn't that be trickier? Do you think? Potentially, you would know better than me. potentially. But I mean, we did see some footage from like their highlights, and everything yeah. looked fine there. I mean, they've shot like stuff at that uh, daily city, daily place thing with with a bit mm-hmm. of daylight. Um, in fact, like I think maybe one of one of the un- unfortunate fortunate things with with uh, shooting. This way was the fact that they didn't have to obviously couldn't rely on an overhead lighting rig. So you had to get a bit of blinding light from like the stand up lights like you used to get in like ROH shows on the ground shots. But again, yeah. it, it, none of this was enough to really bother me because what really stood out to me was the incredible rabid crowd that they got together on this show. I mean, everybody is here on vacation. A lot of them probably a little bit intoxicated and <laughs> everybody like reacting as if they were there watching, you know, probably what was considered the biggest event of this cruise so I, I was curious to know if like the open air atmosphere was going to like any make any difference to the sound and it absolutely did not that to me was the strongest part of this was the crowd yeah and it, it, jim ross explained it was first come first serve for people on the boat and we're talking about like 2500 people that are on this boat and they, there were there were people there like five hours beforehand just to get a spot uh, to watch the show. Like this was obviously the big draw of the four days. Mm-hmm. I also would like to know, maybe, maybe I'll call up the CRTC and I can ask them what, what criteria do you need to pass in order to put up a, a live bug in the top left-hand corner as TSN had for these two hours? What do you mean? It said live in the top. Oh, like gotcha. they had a bug right on the thing. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, is that just like there, there's absolutely <laughs> no, Anyone can put that there. Um, you and I could. We are live as we speak right now, aren't we? It's a live. No people are live to broad, this uh, broadcast from the 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 tape from the tape machine. That's, um, someone is pressing play. Maybe, yes, maybe that, you're that reading, means everything's play. Maybe you're reading it wrong. Maybe it, maybe they're saying live. You know, it's encouraging. Oh, it's just like uh, yeah, it's just like an encour- an encouragement. Yeah. Yes. Um. So the show began with our tag title match, Scorpio Sky and Frankie Kazarian against Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. Uh, opposite on NXT, they were opening up at the semifinals of the Dusty Classic with uh, Fish and O'Reilly against the Grizzled Young Veterans. So those were what each show started off with. And Jim Ross notes how windy it is, and this is probably the first time in 25 years he's been calling a show without his hat, and people are discovering he has hair. <laughs> 
Shivani points out that Paige and Omega enter the ring separately. And then Ross uh, was outlining and looking at the long ramp they have and comparing it to the one from Maple Leaf Gardens, which was uh, quite the observation. And also the close quarters of how close the fans were. There was there was pretty much no space for anyone to do dives. And we had a relatively dive free show. Uh, yeah, relatively dive free. They should put that in the content rating. Relatively <laughs> dive free. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, uh, not much space there, and I guess um, they could, they needed that space to pack as many fans as they could. This was like Cactus Pete's. Uh, for, yes, for you AWF goers out there. Uh, so the they got the advantage on Page. Uh, Omega eventually came in. He did comebacks on Kazarian with a Snapdragon, and then delivering a Snap Suplex to Sky, and. They did the tandem, you can't escape, with Paige's standing shooting star. And then Paige, he was not trying a moonsault to the floor, not on this place. And he just did a safer crossbody to the floor, which was he, the did safer he, version. Did he actually dive into the crowd? I think so. I think he cleared the barricade, because there was like no room on this floor to, mm. to land without going over. Uh, V-Trigger was delivered to Sky, who then avoided the one-winged angel, and Sky then leaps to the top and delivered a Rana to Omega off the turnbuckle. A buckshot lariat misses Scorpio Sky, and Paige hits his partner, Kenny Omega, allowing Sky to hit a TKO on Omega, but Paige broke that up. They go through the commercial. Omega hits a Tiger Driver 98 and a Snapdragon onto Scorpio Sky, and then there's a buckshot lariat to Sky on the ramp. Another one is delivered to Kazarian inside the ring, and Paige pins Kazarian, winning the tag titles for Omega and Hangman. And this is the first title change in AEW history. Yes, that's right. First time we have um, we have a title change hands, and uh, uh, our f- first set of former champions in SCU. Very good match. Um, unfortunately, at least on my feed, I don't know about your on yours, John. I didn't get the picture in picture for this one. No, I didn't either. You're right. Uh, yeah. They. It was clearly picture in picture on TNT because they said it was uh, as such, but we this was a, a full commercial break for us during the match. You know, this was I think a, a match where I feel like if I saw the stuff in between the commercial, I'd like it even more. But you know, even for what we got, I thought the action was great as you would expect from these four. But I also really enjoyed the storytelling here between uh, Hangman Page and Kenny Omega. You know, Page hitting Kenny by accident and then coming back afterwards to single handedly win this match for the team. Uh, I. I, you know, I thought they were always going to go with Paige being sort of the weak link of this group. But in the booking here, they're almost showing off that perhaps he is somebody who is above and outgrown the, the elite. Yeah, I, I think people are really starting to get into this with Omega and Paige. Um, kind of like AEW's version of Otis and Mandy Rose, that each week it's progressing a little further. And you can see the ending where it's coming, but you don't know how they're going to get there. So who's going to make the ham or the fruit cake or uh whatever? Uh well you can't spell hangman without ham, so I I guess it would have to be him, right? <laughs> handman page, okay. Ha- ham man page. The Young Bucks came out to celebrate, but Paige just goes and drinks with the fans. Now this part hey, was interesting. Pa- okay. Did you did you see who was whole Yes. Holding. Yes. So is this what there you're out of nowhere is a uh, scrump oh lifting God. up <laughs> Hangman Page as he goes crowd surfing with some fans' beer? <laughs> oh my goodness! This guy, there's not a there's not a, a hard cam. This dude can't find it, it, it or does it find him? Maybe. Is he yeah. just that magnetic? Uh, great! Hey, can, congratulations to Scrump on 25 episodes of the PWT cast. Had a great one with Colt Cabana I listened to recently. It was very interesting. So uh, look, at, look at him celebrating on a boat. 25 episodes in. Look, he's already uh, where, where, where did you and I go for our 25 episode uh, celebration? Um, I think maybe the, um, the subway next to the, next to the office. Yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't go as f- all, all out as scrumpy here. How, how do you feel about the title change? Because uh, you know, the, to me, I, I almost find it a lot like the Raw title change we saw with uh, Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy this week, where you have an established tag team in SCU who I think we could say were pretty good first tag team champions, but 
maybe seem to have a bit of a ceiling just being stuck in the tag team division. Whereas I think right now we're seeing the belt on two single stars being paired together arguably makes the belt a little bit more interesting. However, what does it do? I, I would say division? a lot. I would say in both cases, a lot more interesting because in both the champions, like the Viking Raiders and SCU, they really didn't have any stories going on. So if, if I'm asked, I would rather it be on the active story that we have going on right now, which is a more intriguing one with Omega and Paige. And based on the end of this, it looks like they're not just dropping SCU cold because it was so subtle that I can't tell if it was like designed to be that way or not, but it was very clear Kazarian was left in the ring and they had one shot of Scorpio Sky on the ramp just staring at him. And then he turns around and walks out without Kazarian and Kazarian has to be helped to the back. And hmm. I, I, I hope it was done on purpose because if so, it tells me like that's a level of subtlety that you often don't get. And I thought it was a really nice touch and I noticed it. So I hope it, I hope it wasn't just me reading too much into something. We shall see. Uh, we'll find out. And Paige, of course, he didn't stay with the Bucks and Omega to celebrate. He just went off on his own. So continuing that but we would hear from all of them later on priscilla kelly and you mind if i just grab some water john quickly uh are you gonna come back or are you gonna brian man me i i will be back okay I'm back. Okay. Can't do a podcast about a boat without water. I know. It, uh, you're getting thirsty. Yes. It, it, ever ever since they announced this thing, I, I've had that T-Pain song in my head. Of course, yes. With Anything Lonely to Island? do with the boat ever for the next 20 years, I think, will yeah. we'll get people to think about that song. Come sail away. Uh, I'm on a boat. I'm sure we can come up with many more songs if we really uh, put our heads together, but we're not going to. I think that's about it, actually. Those are the, the the hits. Just the two. Priscilla Kelly and Britt Baker. Uh, early on, uh, maybe the most interesting part about this match was Excalibur openly talking about stardom. Yeah, yeah. And then, it, uh, like, did JR ask about stardom? Like, like I, I think JR knows what stardom is, but it would, maybe it was one of those, like, hey, Excalibur, explain it to the audience. I thought so, yeah. And then Excalibur just talked about, like, the great talent over there. But just kind of interesting, the... Uh, the, the political fault lines of uh, the wrestling industry and where stardom fits in on AEW's programming. So they quickly go to a break. Uh, Kelly is attacking her in the ropes. Baker then yanks her by the hair. She's starting to play much more, uh, much more of a heel character. And that would uh, lead here to the finish where Baker hit a super kick side rush and leg sweep. And then the lock jaw for the submission win. Uh, not a match that really stood out for me. Um, but Baker gets the win here. And this was much more about the interview afterwards, which I thought was one of the highlights of the show. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like um, I was reading through some of the, the responses on Twitter and also on our message board. And it felt like this might have been, for a lot of people, a bit of a low light, uh, at least not just the match, but but the interview itself. Really? But, yeah, but I, I agree with you. I actually kind of enjoyed it. Oh, you know? I enjoyed this. And a lot. I, in fact, I thought even the match, I thought it was a pretty good performance by Britt Baker. Certainly it was a come down from the match that we saw prior, which was a, a different level of match. Uh, and also there were very mild reactions, I thought, throughout this match. Um, and But I think that has more to do with the fact that Britt Baker is currently in a transitioning phase and that she was still sort of positioned as like the, the baby face in a way in this match, because certainly I didn't feel like it was priscilla kelly that much who the audience i think knows but it hasn't necessarily been introduced to an AEW yet i think you you have to be very careful of which matches you have go through a commercial break and to me like the picture in picture it's a commercial break you are not Mm. captivating my interest during that that picture in picture and Priscilla Kelly is like, this is very much presented as here's the star taking on the unknown. And you're going through a break for this that I think is just begging people to either flip the channel or just kind of check out of the match. And we had five matches on this show and every single one of them had breaks during them. And I, I think that that can be tough on viewers. And this match to me would be hit the hardest by having that, that commercial in the middle of it. 
Sure. What did you think of uh, Priscilla Kelly? She looked fine. Um, didn't leave like a, a strong impression on me during this match, but I, I thought she was fine. She wasn't bad. Yeah, I didn't think it was particularly eye-catching performance either, but I, I do feel like she brings like a different personality to this women's division, and I, I mean, I feel like she 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 looks like a star, so I I would like to see her again. Her goth stuff in MLW, I, I thought was like really cool and different. I, I think that she could uh, play a great character, but unfortunately, this is a company that uh, I wouldn't lean into that because they have more than their fill of that style of character True. that. Uh, I wouldn't just cast her in that kind of a role on AEW at, at the moment. So Shivani gets into the ring with Britt Baker, and he kind of just mentions it was a little questionable the way she won, and Baker just plays, I would say passive-aggressive, but this was kind of aggressive-aggressive by the end of it. She tells Tony, please don't demean my character. I mean, Tony, you're a legend to all of these people, but let's be honest, this is your meal ticket here. I mean, you were working at Starbucks before as a shitty barista. Shitty made the grade on TSN. Shitty's okay. Yeah. Shitty Maybe is when okay. you're only when you're referring to like coffee. Shitty, yes. Bitch, no. Bitch, no. No. Okay. But now you're here and said, none of us look down on you, Tony. They look up to you. And the crowd, whatever they're chanting, they're getting censored here. She says, she has a full-time job being a role model. She's the hottest girl on this boat. She's smart and beautiful. And Tony, did you know I'm a dentist? And hmm. then Jim Ross just throws to break. This end, ended so abruptly. And I didn't catch where it was uh, during this reaction. But this meme of Tony just uttering, what the fuck, uh, <laughs> was just spreading everywhere. Um <laughs> I, I am glad that I, I just stay off Twitter during these shows uh, so I don't uh, get, I guess, uh, coloring my opinions. I, I really like this. I thought Baker was really good here. I liked it, too. I, I found her really entertaining. I mean, the turn is what the crowd wants, and they're giving, essentially, this crowd what they want. Um, I, I, I think, you know, Britt Baker has been somebody who you can criticize has has been given a, a baby face push as an ace way too early on that she probably didn't deserve. And I think it, you're seeing, you know, the, the result of it. And that's sort of like a, a negative, um, bitter reaction to that push. And they're leading into it by turning her full on heel. So I hope this promo means that she can really just start to wrestle her matches as a full on heel now, um, because I think it's the proper direction for her. I think so, too, and I think that I give some latitude there because people want to see her, I think, closer to this role, even though it, it is very abrupt where you're going from this, you know, the the all-American babyface into this character. But mm -hmm. I think it's kind of been building underneath with this audience that they're more than willing to accept her in this role. That's my feeling on she it. She needs to cut a promo, like, on the crowd about, like, you know, like, the, the, maybe that exact thing. Like, why don't you guys like me? Or what did I do that was so wrong? Yeah, like rather than just going into this character without that much explanation. I come out here, I fight my heart out, and crickets, you people just sit on your hands. You're not invested in my match. God, it's like pulling teeth out oh, here. Oh, God damn. Now she can finally use that line. <laughs> They recap Jungle Boy's match with Chris Jericho from last month and lasting the 10 minutes to go into the six-man with Jericho, Santana, and Ortiz against the Jurassic Express. I am expanding our awards next year to include best entrance, and it's going to be this Chris Jericho one. This was oh, awesome. He came was. out, and the crowd is singing his theme. Even when it stops playing, and Jericho was just like, had the, like, Greatest grin on his face. Like, this was just incredible. This audience, total thumbs up for this. This was such a great entrance. Like, Chris Jericho, there was, I felt bad for Jurassic Express because nobody was booing Chris Jericho on his own goddamn cruise ship. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. This was an incredible entrance. You're right. Uh, definitely an early contender for entrance of the year. I'm sure this would be a moment if Braden Harrington is considering going on this boat, it would be for this particular moment. Being able to sing along to, to Judas. They were like, thank you, Chris Chance. I mean, this really, this guy really was a god on this ship. Yeah, he, like, just 
felt like the the biggest star in the world on this uh this ship in front of all his people. Uh Jake Hager was out with uh Jericho as well and Marco Stunt was wearing a, a life preserver that he tossed into the crowd and there's chance for Luchasaurus and you know the match the match is going along they get the heat on Jungle Boy for the longest time including going through the break and Ortiz is on the apron just yelling into the camera how they're the best and then finally, Luchasaurus gets the hot tag, and he headbutts Ortiz, which Jim Ross says, shades of Conor McGregor. Well. Skull on skull, I guess. I was going for Luchasaurus to maybe hit him, hit him with the shoulder. Was there a headbutt in that match? I don't think so, no. Yeah. Was there a headbutt, a headbutt? in the prior Conor match? Uh... I, I'm not thinking of a, of a, head, of a headbutt in a Conor McGregor fight. Right, so... What was he saying? I, I don't know. It was like, I, I don't know if that would be my my parallel to Conor McGregor, uh, a headbutt. Maybe, maybe because maybe he, he, thought he the knocked shoulder. him out with an unconventional body part, like the shoulder. Oh, okay. And, and the head. Uh, there's a double choke slam from Luchasaurus to Ortiz and Jericho. And then Hager attacks Luchasaurus from the apron, and they just fight up the ramp and disappear. Marco is the legal man, and we get like 90 seconds of Marco and Chris Jericho and just the size discrepancy here. Like it was, it was like, this wasn't real life watching these two. It was like a video game. Yeah, I guess so. He hit a four fifty on Jericho for a two count, several covers and the Jericho nailed him with the Judas effect and Jericho pinned him and popped open the bubbly to celebrate, uh, as the the hero here on this boat for providing all of these people their vacation and was willing to take their take their money. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. They gave Marco- this was worth my four figures. <laughs> How much does it cost to get there? It's like I, I'm pretty sure these cabins are like well over a grand. You know, for four nights on a cruise, like definitely. But you know what? Everybody who's ever been on. The, the has raved one? about it. Yeah, yeah, I just heard nothing but great things about those who went on last year. Like it's, I I don't doubt that next year's is going to sell out just as fast. After like this, it, are you kidding me? The moment they oh. put those things on sale, that like everybody's going to want to go. They made this this cruise look look like the most fun thing in the world for a wrestling fan with this episode. Like, honestly, like when Jericho first came up with I, this idea, like doing a cruise, it's an extremely risky proposition. Yeah, and because the precedent has been set by 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 wrestling uh, cruises to be super corny and and not really great. Well, just just like themed cruise ships in general, like that's that's a really tough. It's it's so much overhead. It's an incredible amount of insurance, like um, tons of red tape you have to go through to pull this off. And look look at this thing he has built for himself. Like it's it's a really impressive feat, to be honest. Absolutely, yes. So the show continues, and MJF comes out. They recap the program with Cody. He got Excalibur to kiss the ring, and they explain that Wardlow is off training for the cage match. That is a month away. How do you train for a cage match? Is he, like, just going to, like, the local high school and, like, climbing the baseball diamond fences and... Could be at the dunks. Slamming doors. Could be at the McDonald's play place. Climbing. We need some vignettes of Wardlow training specifically for a cage match. So it was MJF against Joey Janela. Uh, Janela bowed to the man dressed up as Jesus in the front row, unless it was actually Jesus, and he had resurrected here on this this boat. MJF offers his hand uh, to shake Joey Janela's hand, and the crowd <laughs> chanted, fuck that shit. TSN got both. MJF then goes off to take a walk. Janela goes after him. He gets eye raked, but then back body drops MJF in. MJF is using Aubrey Edwards as the shield. And then afterwards, uh, we come back. Janela hits a superplex. He climbs back up for the elbow drop when Kip Sabian and Lana come out and they just start making <laughs> out. Yes. Janela misses the top rope elbow and is hit with the double cross and MJF wins. Certainly, um, very much a. I, I think you could classify as a bit of a WWE finish here. Uh, but they, I mean, that is the story that they're telling. I don't really, 
dislike it. I, I am still kind of waiting for this Penelope, uh, Kip and, and Joey story to maybe come up with a bit more of a unique and original wrinkle than just your generic, hey, I'm dating your ex-girlfriend, I'm going to distract you in your matches, we're going to wrestle. Like, I feel like the the type of wrestling AEW is trying to present calls for a bit more originality and creativity than that, and I, I'm still waiting for it with this angle. They're uh, literally cribbing, like, the worst thing on WWE television at the moment. I, I think this angle is, like, the complete opposite of what this audience wants, and it's a low-rent version of it, too. Like, it just feels like such a copy of an angle that's been panned on WWE uh, at the I moment. I wouldn't say they're necessarily copying, like, the Rusev Lana thing beat for beat. I think the Rusev yeah. Lana thing is that... Is, is the, the heat is like I'm watching my ex make out with my rival. Like it's I don't know. It's way too similar. To like me. the ruse of Lana thing is actually is taking that cliche and turning into something way more fucked up than I think it it ever needs to be in a wrestling show. This is just I think I would say more of a level two compared to like that level fifteen. Uh, but I, I I'm waiting for something a bit more original, and and I think maybe if. If there's a major difference between that, the Rusev Lana thing and this, is that this this one could potent- feels a bit more real because you you know that these two are an actual couple and they are actually broken up and Kip and Penelope are an actual item. So um, t- honestly, for me, the most interesting stuff c- to come out of this thing has been on Twitter with like Penelope uh, and um, uh, uh, Joey Janela cutting into each other. Um, it, really trashy, actually on on. On Twitter, but I mean, if you're going to go this route, you might as well go a little bit more trashy and kind of cut pretty deep with some of these promos. And I think the best stuff has actually been online. So I'm waiting for for maybe some of that promo work to make its way onto TV, because right now it just feels like a bit of a, yeah, you know, just still in the starting blocks type of thing. Yeah, I, I, w- I would love to know what, uh, what's going on, on on Twitter. I have no idea. Have you been completely off? Uh, I, I mean, I'm not up on whatever Janelle and Penelope have been doing, so. Yeah, I barely am either. I, I will say, like, you know, being away in Japan, like, the the deleting Twitter off of my uh, phone was, was definitely, like, a really nice break. Oh, it's, it's the best. So, uh, after the match, MJF, uh, he continues to cut a promo on Cody saying he was right last week. I am a chapter in his book. I'm the last goddamn one, which made it through the censors. Cody comes out. MJF tells him, cut your music, and just pretty much is needling Cody, noting that you can't touch me. He drops the microphone in front of Cody, then kicks it away, and as he leaves, he gives Cody the middle finger. The crowd chants asshole at him, and then Cody says that I can't touch you, but they can. And there are the young bucks to super kick MJF and take him over, and he takes the big pool bump, which was great, which was awesome. You know, if you're not going to be able to throw somebody off a boat, which I think would kill somebody, um, <laughs> throwing somebody into the pool would, is the next best thing. I think we just wanted a big splash with this, and they gave it to him, and MJF took a hell of a bump. They did a montage of the crews, and then Shivani. This guy was just on interview duty tonight, interviewed Omega and Paige, one drinking a beer, the other drinking a tea. And Paige says he whooped both their asses tonight, referring to SCU. And Omega is asked about facing Pac for this rubber match. He calls Pac a human excrement. He'll get his rubber match, but the tag titles are his priority. And then the Bucks walk in and Paige notes that it's funny that we won the titles before you guys did. And he takes off, and yeah, I guess the idea here is that the at some point you'll probably get uh, the Bucks challenging them for the tag titles at some point with Omega caught in between. I mean, that, with Omega caught in between, and he's going to have to choose between his partner and his elite members. So yeah. I, I think this is all like going in a pretty positive direction. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, my, my, uh, some people know my, my match of uh, the last year, not uh, the match. My match of 2018 was the golden lovers versus the bucks. And if that might be any sort of indication of what type of storytelling they might be able to do in the match here, I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm enjoying page here a lot. I am finding the character very interesting. And I think Kenny and the bucks are serving it up pretty well too. Jericho, uh, they announced for next week in Cleveland, Jericho, Santana, and Ortiz against Darby Allen and Private Party. 
the Young Bucks against the Butcher and the Blade, and Cody against Kip Sabian. I wouldn't say any of these really jump out at me. I I do enjoy uh, Jericho being in there with Darby Allen, but I will also say that I think when Jericho wrestles, it should be a big deal. And this feels as like we're just throwing something together, like completely cold, nothing existing with Private Party or Darby Allen. And I just feel Chris Jericho, it should, I, I would never want to trivialize his matches. Sure. Right. Um, I, 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 I agree with you. At the same time, I, I, I feel like, still the need to commend like a wrestling promotion for telling its audience what to expect the next week. Yeah. And I think AEW needs to be doing that, especially for these, you know, to be drawing in these cities and like, let's be honest, next week does not really have a big hook to it at at all. It's It's not even a brand. uh, It doesn't even have a title. Like we've come off of like a Memphis homecoming. We've come off of a, uh, a bash at the beach and then the boat thing. So it felt like a series of like mini pay-per-views almost. So Next week, um, maybe we can come up with something. Where is it? Okay, it's in. They mentioned it's in John Moxley's home state of Ohio. Okay. Uh, it's going to be in Cleveland. So, get ready for it, way. Cleveland Mox. <laughs> oh, save that for the title next week. I, I'm putting that down as the title for next week. Lovely, man. I'm just. I, You're on fire. H- how this much talent stays in my body, I, I don't understand. Jericho comes out for commentary for the main event. This was awesome. I could definitely listen to Jim Ross and Jericho call a whole show together. These two were excellent together. They were great. Yeah. I mean, I think it was almost like Jericho like was really it all it was almost like he was too good, if you know what I mean. Like he he played like the analytical kind of like um role here almost a little too well in that like you could tell he really wanted to put both guys over and did such a good job of doing it that i i almost feel like it it was a little bit incongruent with i think the the sli- the smarmy and, and slimy heel he's been playing otherwise but um but yes it was very good i i really enjoyed these two together uh excalibur almost like took a back seat here in the match um so it's pack and moxley number one contenders match and moxley's eye is all wrapped up which apparently is like he's been walking around the, the cruise all week with his uh, his eye hidden or wrapped up doing karaoke even <laughs> with half an eye which might not be as easy as you think oh my god it's like that's probably not good for your eye to be have it bandaged up i hope he's mm-hmm. uh i hope he's not keeping that bandage on all day long it's kind of gross imagine taking that off each night um, you know, that's part of the, that's part of the sacrifice of being a wrestler. It is. Uh, so the heat for this match was Pac working on Moxley's eye and, uh, Ross and Jericho just had this great interaction where Jericho's explaining about the eye injury. We didn't want to do it, Jim. And Jim just responds, well, Chris, you, you sure didn't show much restraint. Pac is hitting him with the elbows to the eye. This is when we get the your ship sucks, which Jericho explained there is another ocean liner next to them that the fans <laughs> are taking their time to chant at. Imagine if it was like a Disney cruise, like full of families, and it's there, a wrestling boat. All I'm going to say is that there's a reason wrestling fans sometimes get a negative opinion. And if you were <laughs> on a Disney cruise ship with your family and you're listening to 2,000 uh, individuals chanting your ship sucks... Um, that's probably going to back up your pre-existing thoughts, even though it may maybe is not an accurate representation of all wrestling. At least they weren't saying fuck that boat. No, that, that was an hour ago. That was the, that was the, uh, God knows what, what ship that was. Uh, Pac hit a jawbreaker and then he did it to the eye, like some really creative stuff. Like if you really want to take out someone's eye, Pac was your, your textbook here. Uh, Pac climbed to the top and it seemed like he was going for the black arrow and he was kind of off balance and then he hesitated and he just does this 450 landing on Moxley's knees. And then moments later, he gets back up and he misses with the black arrow. So I don't know what was going on there, but it seemed kind of jumbled. Was this? Moxley, uh, well, you know what I liked was Excalibur blaming it on the high winds. It, it might have been accurate, too. Yeah, like I, it made sense to me. 
I, I thought what they did very well on this show was just explaining the different environment they're in, even mm-hmm. down to Jericho saying the ring is elevated another foot or two higher. So it's that bigger of a drop when you fall out of the ring. And it kind of is like constructing your own, like the environment of which you're competing in. It's, it's totally different here. This is like the green monster of wrestling environments or, or UFC fighters fighting in Denver. Like, sure. At, at, at above sea level. Like I, I, I think that's part of the interesting aspect of sport is when you can introduce the, el- the elements into it and how, ha- and how you would strategize to wrestle uh, in a certain place versus another. It's like, you know, you're playing mortal Kombat, and every stage is different and has its own character. You might be fighting in the pit where the goal might be different from fighting uh, in, in another spot in mortal Kombat. I'm not, were you a mortal Kombat guy? More street fighter than yeah, mortal me, Kombat, me but I was, uh, I was a fan of Scorpio. That All was right. my go-to. Back, yeah. back A. Get Very over cheap, here. but it worked. Yep. Uh, Pat kid kicked out of a double arm DDT and then hit his superplex. Went for the brutalizer, and Moxley fought to get his foot on the rope. Then he rips the eye patch off of Moxley. He's punching the eye, but then Moxley catches him with another double arm DDT before hitting the official paradigm shift for the win and it's going to be jericho moxley at revolution february 29th and that's how the show closed with jericho just standing tall with the title and moxley in the ring with his eye patched up all right yeah um i think a good match um admittedly for me i i felt like the jet lag was a little bit affecting me by the end here but um, the atmosphere, I thought, was still fantastic all the way through. And all in all, like I thought this was certainly a very successful experiment, doing a, a TV taping of a wrestling show on a boat. Uh, by the end of it, it, it felt like it, it was a great ad for the Rock and Wrestling Rager, and I think a great ad for next year's edition of Dynamite that's going to take place from the boat. Yeah, I, I didn't think any of the wrestling was like blow away great. I think the tag match was... Uh, match of the show mm-hmm. and it and it was very good but i thought this show this was more so about just a different environment and it was very much the the scene that was to me the big draw uh, of this show i mean the wrestling was fine but you know nothing was approaching like we what we got last week with that uh that tag opener uh with the four teams um mm-hmm. but that's a pretty high high bar to hold everything to um the wrestling though it was it it, it ranged to me from from good to uh, above average for the opener. And it said certain things in motion for the future. I, I think the, the page Kenny stuff continues to be really interesting. Uh, obviously Mox versus Jericho seems, you know, at this point, pretty, pretty like set in stone already. And I don't think anybody doubted the, the, the way that this main event was going to go, but nobody's complaining either that Moxley won this one and is going on to face Jericho, but all the storytelling makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I think that AEW now, they can really kick things into gear for, I, I think, both shows. Because NXT, after this Worlds Collide gets out of the way, which it, it really feels like just kind of this obligation pay-per-view for the NXT side to have to get to. That now they can focus on the NXT takeover next month in Portland. And conversely, AEW can kind of go into the full uh, promotion of Revolution next month. So you have both shows that are gearing up for pay-per-views in February. Were you surprised that we um, didn't get more, I suppose, uh, I, we didn't get any Dark Order, um, none of the, the, what is it, the the Brandy stuff either? Um, well, Brandy was not on the cruise because uh, she's got her uh, speech at the Natby convention, and I think she had also right. mentioned like something about her passport being stolen or something right. like that. So, right, okay. yeah, she wasn't even on the cruise. But, yeah, I I think it made for a better show without, like, the, the weakest parts as well. And this was not a show that had, like, it was pretty much straight wrestling. It was, everything was in front of the live crowd. There were no backstage vignettes other than the Paige and Omega interview with the Bucks. Um, maybe did, one other interview that I'm not thinking Did they do Dark? Of. They did Dark for what I, last week they taped, like, an, a huge amount of matches. So I think it's going to be more matches that were taped last week that they use for dark next week, unless it was other stuff taped on the boat the day before. I see. Yeah. I see. So, uh, there you go. That was AEW dynamite and we'll head to the forum and see what everyone had to say about the, the boat edition of AEW. 
eight point two three. So this seemed to be uh, this connected strongly with our form. Brandon from Oshawa writes, excellent episode. I w- it was exactly what I was hoping for. It looked amazing, and I'm glad they used the surrounding. I love Moxley and Pac brawling up the balcony and MJF getting thrown into the pool. It took me back to one of my favorite Nitro moments when Rey Mysterio dropped kicked Ric Flair into a pool. I was hoping for a buffet brawl to top it all off. Can you guys think of any local cool settings, any other cool settings that they can hold Dynamite in? I'm hoping now that Bash at the Beach is back, they can bring... They can put a ring on the beach one year, similar to Bash at the Beach 95. Any other cool settings? Okay. Um, I I will say I really enjoyed the setting here, but I also wouldn't want to overdo these just for the sake of them. I think this is kind of like a once a year kind of thing you do. Um, I want to see a wrestling show take place in the frigid December cold of Canada. They should go to Nunavut. The Winter Classic. Yeah, but with guys in their underwear wrestling. Yeah, uh, maybe in a cave in in, uh, in the UK. Martin yeah. Bushby can direct them to the the underground cave, and they so, could do one from there. Yeah, swimming pool as DDT has done. Um, no, it, seriously, uh, I, I I do feel like it kind of has to rely a bit more on sort of like a party atmosphere to get a great crowd like this, and maybe a hotter climate as well. I'm trying to think like what might also work. Um, there, there are a lot of things I feel like you could do. Uh, like, could you imagine like a wrestling show in like this kind of industrial warehouse? I could, I, I don't know if it's, uh, if I would want to picture it there, but you, you could do, um, you, you, you could certainly let your mind go wild. Maybe, uh, maybe like you have to remember like factory. Okay. Uh, in WCW, like those those shows at uh, at Club Lavella, those are very fondly remembered. But I don't feel like anyone goes back and says, "Oh, remember those great shows at at uh, at uh, in Sturgis at the Biker Rally that were outside?" Like those to me were, yeah. the The location was really different, but I I didn't think those were great shows. I didn't think the atmosphere added anything, and we're just like poor shows. So I think you got to be careful when you are getting uh, too far out of what works like this to me on the cruise ship. I think it works once a year. Yes. Yes. We got an MJ from NJ who says this felt like a special show, almost pay-per-view pay-per-view feel minus the crowd size. Kudos to AEW and TNT for pulling this off. And what a plug for Chris Jericho in an alternate universe. This is NXT show tonight. I can't believe this guy has an annual cruise that sells out. Brilliant. The tape nature actually led to better flow in broadcasting. Graphics added something, and I appreciated the different set. Felt reminiscent of their MGM press conference a year ago. Still, nothing helps JR who couldn't help himself from calling a super kick party sweet chin music. I don't think I'm being too critical. His job is to sell new talent, and getting their big spots confused with the 90s doesn't help, and talent feel like knockoffs. 10 out of 10 Judas entrances. All right, next up here, we have Nick from Lansing. What is there to say when you have a show that good? Exciting start with the tag title switch and a strong ending with a new number one contender. They used the boat well, throwing MJF in the pool, which was fun. Any pitches for unique locations? AEW, it just seems everyone wants to come up with like new locations now. These locations will be great when they come out with a video game so that you can have different arenas. Um, Why not have something in the middle of a Fozzie concert? I, I... do not like that idea at all of doing a show at a concert. And like, how different would that necessarily be from what they do now? Yeah. And I think you kind of want to keep the audiences separate. Like I think there's people that would go to this concert that don't necessarily want to see a wrestling show. And but I mean, versa. just visually like those concerts take place in arenas, don't they? Uh, well, d- different locations. Yeah. The, they do some outdoor shows. They do like smaller clubs as well, but some, we got to know one from Vaughn who says, Hey guys, glad to have you both back for the Dynamite Post show. Glad to hear you both enjoyed your trips. Sure, I had nitpicks about the show. For example, the women's match wasn't all that good, but the show flew by as always, and I loved the setup on board the ship. TSN continues to try and disrupt things, though, with their censoring. However, the visual of MJF getting thrown into the pool makes me give the show an automatic 10 out of 10. Well, there you go. That offsets everything for, for Noah. Gives us a perfect show. The perfect show occurred from 8 till 10 p.m. Eastern time. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We appreciate the feedback. And 
As we mentioned, Thursday, we are not going to have a cafe hangout, but we will be live Friday night after SmackDown and the NWA Hard Times pay-per-view. So if you are a patron, uh, you can join us live. We're going to run through those shows, and then we'll open up the phone lines, and we can chat about Worlds Collide, the Royal Rumble, anything else you would like to discuss on Friday night. So I'm looking forward to that way. Yeah, I am. And also, uh, if you're a Post Wrestling Cafe patron, right now in your feeds is our latest edition of Rewind Away. Rewind Away number 53, talking about All Japan Women's Dream Slam 1, a show that uh, features uh, some of the best women's wrestling, I think, that has ever been created. So it, it was a real pleasure to go back and talk about that one with Chase Klaus. Uh, really impressed with Chase's knowledge about the scene, and it was a lot of fun talking about it. So look forward to uh, all of those shows coming your way this weekend with uh, a Worlds Collide post show with Braden and Davey Saturday night. Sunday, we've got Thunderstruck with WH Park and Martin Bushby as they will be chatting the Jushin Liger Shinjiro Otani match from March of 96. And also on Friday, failed to mention British Wrestling Experience is dropping with all three going through the uh, biggest matches and stories of the 2010s across the European scene. So look for that in your British Wrestling Experience feed on Friday, which should be a great show. Everything can be found at postwrestling.com. And we will be back later on this week. Goodbye, everybody.